folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. It is in time for the holiday season, so I'm about to review a Christmas movie that came out just 30 years ago on November 27, 1985, which was last week for um, November 27, of course. So I'm about to review the film that was from the producers of Superman the movie, as well as the writer and the director of Supergirl. It's called Santa Claus the Movie. This is the 20th anniversary edition that came out on DVD back in 2005 by Anchor Bay and it's um, a very substantial release for its time. It, had, it has a very shiny uh, cover art. It looks really cool. You know, with a picture of David Huddleston you know, who later went on to play the Big Lebowski as Santa Claus. Yeah, of course, he has done some numerous uh, TV roles in his career. In fact, he even played uh, yeah, Grandpa Arnold in um, The Wonder Years. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it's, it's a great film. It's uh, not as good as all the other Christmas movies that we had, even later on, too, but I still think it's worth watching more than once. It's it's a cult classic. I mean, it wasn't well received from critics, uh, but it, it it had some light to it. I think that what made it uh, special is that it it did have the Christmas spirit. I mean, it has the touch. I mean, it had some neat special effects that are very magical. They even use animatronics for the reindeers. You know, sometimes they use some real ones. Other times they'll just use the animatronics. You know, for the flying sequences and all that. And plus, it was shot in a great location. In fact, they actually shot this movie at Pinewood Studios in London, England. So that's the perfect location for it, since this is the same studio that, that filmed uh, all the James Bond movies. It's in the same stage number, by the way. Yeah, it has um, a great cast. I mean, and not only David Huddleston, but you get uh, Dudley Moore as Patch the Elf. Yeah, he was a, a vendive. And you get the evil um, toy manufacturer tycoon named uh, BZ, you know, who's played by John Lithgow as one of his over-the-top performances in his career. So you just can't go wrong with this movie. And and I know uh, McDonald's had sponsored this film like back in 1985, and I know they started selling some some books for their Happy Meals, so you had to collect them all. It had a wonderful soundtrack that's done by Henry Mancini, so it's um, fun. So anyway, um, this release um, has all the extras right here on the back. Some great uh, picture art here of the, the cast and characters, all shiny. Unfortunately, um, this edition doesn't have um, the additional deleted scenes that the, the later version has which is released on Blu-ray by uh, Lionsgate. And someday I'll try to get that film on Blu-ray if they have it for a decent price. Because I got this film back in 2007 at Albertsons for only five bucks. <laughs> so it was worth it. I mean, it, it was worth the price for this movie. Yeah, because I always loved this film. And, and, and yeah, I mean, it's... It wasn't on my top favorites of, yeah, the top 30 favorites of holiday films. But, you know what, I would consider this as one of the um, other favorites of gems that, that sadly not many people talk about as much. But I know they will play it on TV. I mean, they, they have played it for a while. Um, but I've, I figure this was um, such an underrated classic. It, it was a big budget film. That uh, the, the executive producer Alexander Sulkin, along with his son Ia, and they got Pierre Spangler being the producer for the film, along with uh, writers David and his wife uh, Leslie Newman. And yeah, and they also got um, you know some cinematographers like Arthur Ebelson and editor Peter Hollywood and all the rest. I mean, it's a great team of, of people who wanted to make uh, basically 
Santa Claus version of Superman. So it's like if the Man of Steel has an arch nemesis like Lex Luthor, then Little Saint Nick will definitely have his arch nemesis, BZ. So, why not? Um, it stars Dudley Moore, who's been in a lot of stuff um, in his career before his passing in sometime in 2002 due to his uh, that disease known as progressive uh, subnuclear palsy, you know, PSP. But he's put in some excellent films like um, you know, like Ten, Mickey and Maud, Arthur, you name it, those films. Yeah. John Lithgow, who's always been best known for playing some creepy roles in several movies he's been in, yeah, including Blowouts, Raising Cain, Ricochet, um, even in a, his role in Terms of Endearment. Yeah. He, he's a very good actor. Yeah. David Huddleston, of course, uh, who went on to later play uh, The Big Lebowski in the film The Big Lebowski. But he also had numerous TV roles, uh, and including uh, The Wonder Years, and Emergency, and all the rest. Yeah, Judy Cornwell from the TV show Keeping Up Appearances, uh, a BBC show. Burgess Meredith, yeah, a great actor, who is no longer with us, of course. Um, but he went on to play the Penguin in Batman, and went on to do uh, his role in, in the Rocky films. Jeffrey Kramer, Christian Fitzpatrick, Kerry K. Heim, John Barrett, John Berard, Anthony Ardano, Melvin Hayes, Don Estelle, Tim Stern, Peter O'Farrell, Christopher Ryan, and Keith Hyden. It's written by David and Leslie Newman, with producer Pierre Spangler and E.R. Sulkin, and it's directed by Jonat Sharok, who is the director of Supergirl, along with movies like Jaws 2 and Somewhere in Time as well as doing some numerous TV shows like uh, The Rockford Files, Kojak, Ironside, and even some shows in, in the 80s like The New Twilight Zone, The Den New Twilight Zone, and all the rest. So let's get to the film. The movie began somewhere in the 14th century. We meet a peasant woodcutter named Claus, who's played by David Huddleston, along with his wife, Anya, who's played by Judy Cornfield, has decided to deliver all the gifts to all the little children in certain villages everywhere. But that is until one night, during a huge blizzard storm, Claus, Anya, and two reindeers, Donner and Blitzen, are being frozen until they are being rescued, only to be transported by the North Star on top of the sky as it shines through into a a Christmas tree and it turns out to be as we speak the North Pole where all several of the little elves had appeared only to be visited by the head of the elves um, Dooley who's played by John Berard along with an inventive elf named Patch who's played by Dudley Moore and a more down-to-earth Puffy who's played by Anthony O'Donnell so Dooley tells Claus that it's destiny to deliver toys to all the children around the world during Christmas Eve, which the elves will make their large workshops possible. Yeah, once they took them inside their elves' home, that's in the background. So Donner and Blitzen are joined by six other reindeers, and they were being fed by magic food, at this rate the magic dust, that allows them to fly. When Christmas Eve comes, Claus is being approached by the, the oldest of the elves, the ancient one, who is played by Burgess Meredith, who renames him simply as Santa Claus. So centuries have passed as the mythologically of Santa has created until it reaches the 20th century, which would lead to the 80s, 
as Santa has been exhausted by the continuous workload that he must do every year due to the world's increasing population. And I know, because they also even come up with their own lists, such as the naughty or nice list. So, according to their plan, Anya suggests that they elicit an assistant to join in. So, in which Patch and Puffy must compete to earn a competition to produce the most toys in a limited amount of time. So, Patch uses a machine to actually build all the toys using all the paints, wood, and nails all together so that way it can go as fast as it can before he finally wins. But of course, it begins to produce shoddy work without his knowledge. That during his annual deliveries, Santa befriends a homeless 10 year old orphan boy named uh, Joe, who's played by Christian Fitzpatrick, who's was in New York City and was taken for a flight around the skyscrapers of Manhattan in his sleigh. When Santa takes over for Joe to actually fly the reindeers and be able to go all the way straight to the Brooklyn Bridge, much to Santa's horror, and also begins to perform the super duper looper around the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, which is an aerial trick that involves them doing a complete 360 degree turn. But Donner, of course, is afraid of of uh, heights, so yeah, because he has arachophobia. So Santa takes Joe on his deliveries where they meet a nine year old girl named Cornelia, or simply Corny, who's played by um, Carrie uh, Kai Heim, a wealthy child and also an orphan who, who fed Joe one previous night. So on Christmas Day, Patch toys had begun to fall apart. That's where all the, the children had started crying. And yeah, even worse, uh, the wagon had fallen apart and, and got run over by a school bus. Yeah, very messed up scene. So he decided to quit his job and have uh, Puffy take over as his assistant. So he winds up moving around into the city of New York City where he finally uh, meets an evil toy manufacturer named BZ, who's played by John Litgow, who, during the conference, we begin to find out about his toys that he's been creating, because they're all completely dangerous, such as that one uh, toy doll that was inflammable, where, in fact, you even see a director cameo appearance, uses a cigarette and lights the, the, uh, the doll on fire. And then the next, they even showed a stuffed uh, panda bear, yeah, or a dis yeah, it does look like a panda bear. It's actually a teddy bear, where suddenly it's being filled with get this nails and and lots of glass shards all the way around. Yes, yeah, this is the kind of toys that's definitely going to cause children some lots of cuts all the way around, and that's going to suck too. I mean. Seriously, I mean, who on earth would sell toys like that for children? Exactly. So now uh, Patch is being visited by BC. So they, they created a plan, well at this rate Patch did, on actually coming up with a new special toy since uh, Patch had went inside a local toy store where he saw one of uh, BC toys and see if maybe they can work together as a team, you know, to actually... Um, fix everything and it turns out that he's actually creating a gift that might be sent out for free because oh. he does give everything for free anyway no money of charge and this is that one memorable scene which I'm definitely going to do my impression of John Lickell's character BC just as Patch was about to tell him this about giving away something for free and this is where he says, Whoa, I've never seen anybody turn red like that. And this is where he does, For free? <laughs> oh man, that, that was classic. His plan was to actually sell lots of um, lollipops that actually make you fly like Mary Poppins. <laughs> so yes, 
And everybody who tried out the, the Canny were actually um, flying already up in the air. Yeah, including that kid who actually uh, took out a basketball and, and made a slam dunk once he was up in the air. <laughs> yeah, flying up in the air, that is. And so, so they were selling it like hotcakes and making millions and millions of, of money or so, even though they were selling it for free. I guess that's what they were going for. So that so all that plan actually worked, which causes Santa to become very devastated, meaning that now he's going to be replaced by BZ. Yeah, meaning that now he's coming up with a, his own plans by creating a Christmas holiday called Christmas Two, which is going to set on March 25th. So now they'll be able to sell even more of the toys that. He's been wanted to to do for years now, which I know he's been doing them. Not to mention, uh, BC is also uh, related to um, Cornelia as well. He's his uh, niece. So while Patch was working all night, BC assistant uh, Dr. Ever Towser, who's played by Jeffrey Kramer, appears in his house to reveal that the candy canes that they created, you know, which uh, which is basically magical candy canes that by using all the magic dust that Patch is working on will soon explode if it's overheated. So BC proposed that they flee to Brazil and let Patch take the fall for the criminal neglect while Joe and Cornelia's eavesdrop on the conversation and, until Joe was being caught by them and was locked in the basement of BC's factory. So Patch finds Joe and discovers Santa makes a carving for Joe that he resembles him. And thrilled that Santa remembers him, Patch and Joe will set off in the Patchmobile. Yeah, the Patchmobile that he created Yeah, er earlier in the film. Yeah, where he actually used all the candy canes uh, in order for it to fly. So they're trying to go back to the North Pole as Cornelia sent a letter to Santa informing him about the situation that's about to happen. Despite the fact that Comet and Cupid are having the flu, they decided to take um, all the other reindeers, so since they're only two men short. So Santa came to the rescue to bring Cornelius around to, to go after um, Joe and Patch on the Patchmobile until the car explodes. So, of course, they finally make it back to the North Pole and just in time, so now they finally get to stay for a while just to see what's going to happen next. But meanwhile, BZ, on the other hand, is already in trouble with the cops as he was already fleeing by eating all the candy canes, those magical candy canes, and, and flew up all the way up in, into the sky. Yeah, that's where we lead to the end of the film, where he's actually flying, sort of similar to the scene in Superman. So Sando and the rest of the elves are are already, you know, having a joyous dance party around the North Pole. So they're now, so now they're having a good time, and there you have it. So yeah, I thought the film was actually um, quite decent for a uh, Christmas film, you know, like Santa Claus the movie. I mean, granted, it's it's not the best out of both worlds because I know the film had negative reviews from critics when it, when it first came out. Although I I think it had some mixed reviews. Although Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 17 percent. Yeah, it didn't really deserve its backlash, in my opinion. Because I I mean, granted, I do agree the film did have its flaws. I mean, there were several scenes. I I kind of wish it didn't appear in the film. Like for example. There was a scene in the movie where, because it's funny too, because I actually read that that they actually made this movie out of its budget, you know, since they wanted to come up with something new, since they were making all the Superman films, that they wanted to make a movie without any of that in the mix. But, like, for instance, cruelty. However, I did actually saw some cruelty in that one scene where they actually showed a, bo a little boy hurting a young kitten in front of the girl. It was supposed to be a present for her. That's something I do not want to see. 
in a movie like this. But I guess they might have had to use that scene in order to get into the whole naughty or nice list. Yeah, because now we begin to find out that, you know, the little boy is indeed naughty. So this was something new as a suggestion to Enya and the elves. But well, that's the kind of scene I probably did not want to see in, in a movie like that. But And of course it had the toys, you know, all those dangerous toys that BC has been making using all these glass shards and nails and inflammable and all that stuff. I mean, come on. That's not something I want to see too. So that that's part of his flaws. And, and all those other scenes in, in the film that went into it. So, But despite of that, um, I didn't think the film wasn't that bad. I mean, I, it had a great cast. Uh, I, I love their performances, all by uh, David Holston, because he was very good as Santa Claus. I mean, in fact, he was definitely the right choice to play him, since I know they started getting other actors to play him too, including uh, Carol Connor, you know, the actor from the TV show All in the Family. He was actually going to play Santa Claus, but but uh, Sulkin, however, suggested David Huddleston because, unfortunately, he was very good in in several of the numerous TV shows he's been in. So why not? He seems like he got the spirit, and he even looks like Santa. So he, he got the job. And the fact that they got uh, John Lithgow in the film was was an icing on the cake because let's face it, he's been best known for playing over the top performances in his career. I mean he played tons of creepy roles in several movies that I've seen already and he was definitely the right choice to play. I mean he was sort of basically what he is a Lex Luthor. And then they also got Dudley Moore too and yep uh, this was also Sulkin's choice because I mean he was the right choice to play an inventive elf and you know, given all these um, elf puns that well not too many but it, but, I mean, because I know I saw the movie. Um, yeah, I, I thought he was um, perfect enough for the role because he's also funny. He's very generous, too. Uh, I think he's very smart. I mean, he's the kind of elf you want to you wanna deal with. I mean, despite of his problems that he's been going through. You know, with the competition with the other elf. And, and he was trying his best to become uh, Santa's existence because he thought what he do was right. I mean, it's not easy these days to become an assistant. And yeah, I, I thought this was his uh, best performance, too. Um, it had a wonderful score by legendary Henry Massini, yeah, who, who often does uh, the score for uh, the Pink Panther series. Yeah, I, I was, I'm always familiar with that theme, too. But he was very good. And, and they had an awesome soundtrack by uh, that one song called Christmas All Over the World by uh, Sheena Easton. Yeah, that, that was a very good song. It, it worked so well. I mean, it, it, I mean, it just makes this movie look even better than ever. And it, it just felt right. It, it has the tone. It, it felt like all the Christmas movies that I've seen in like in the early 50s or so. It even has that style to it, considering that this was an 80s film that's being shot by, you know, the aspect ratio of 2.39. I mean, it was a perfect aspect ratio for it, so yeah. And it's also interesting that studio TriStar Pictures, which also released uh, Supergirl, was, I guess, they were reluctant to release this movie, considering the fact that before this, they did release a horror film that involves Santa Claus, which, yeah, Santa Claus becoming a killer. In reality, it was just... Uh, a serial killer dressed up as Santa Claus. Yeah, a crazy person with a mental illness. So, yeah, that's the one that causes a lot of controversy from parents out there. Yeah. And yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Silent Night, Deadly Night. So I guess this seems more like an apology for the studio to do so. It's too bad that the critics uh, didn't do much for, for this movie, but... But I think there are some critics that probably did enjoy it for, for what it's worth. and you know, Because it already became a cult following. I mean, after all, we started getting like VHS tapes, you know, Laserdisc, DVD, and, and now Blu-ray. So that's becoming a cult phenomenon now. So. 
And I think it made its money out of its budget of you know, 30 to 50 million dollars. I mean, for its domestic, it was 23.7 million dollars it made at the box office. So it did pretty well. And I think it was one of the better Christmas movies that came out in 1985 over that other Christmas movie that came out from Disney called One Magic Christmas which to me was sort of depressing it didn't seem like it had the spirit I mean it did but not as much I don't know I haven't seen One Magic Christmas in years but I think it's one of those movies where you'd be better off just watching other better Christmas movies so I don't know but either way um, I did enjoy this movie you know, despite of its flaws. So anyway, I give Santa Claus the movie three and a half stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.